Now they were bringing it back to Orlando and giving it, you know, selling it out to, in other words, a bunch of them went together and one guy picked it up. But Dennis was just really doing, doing well at that time. I think that he's expanded now. He's, he's gotten more ground. He's gotten into more beef now too, I think. So additional species, they must be managed. You can't simply throw them all together and expect success. It will be a wreck. Um, each species must have what they need. So with pigs, if you're gonna throw pigs in with the cattle and there's no shade out there, that's not gonna work very well. They're gonna suffer in July and August. Hey, it's hot and a pig's gotta have some kind of shade because they don't sweat and uh, they can actually die on a really hot summer day in Missouri. They would not do well. They may not die, but they're not gonna put any weight on. Um, so if you look at nature, uh, and that's what we like to do. We like to try to mimic what nature is doing. And so the more species is, is, is always a good thing. Um, that was in uh, Kruger Park. There was baboons and impalas. And that's just the two that I got right there. There was elephants in there. There was kudu, um, there was, uh, we saw some hyenas right down the road from there. There's lion, there's leopards, there's the predators. And when you go through Kruger, they're all in groups. These, these are animals that are being preyed on and they're all together and they're all alarm systems. You know, and there's birds up in the trees. Everything's watching those leopards and those lions. Um, Africa's kind of a mess now, but if, if it ever gets cleared up again over there and you have a chance and you go to South Africa, go to Kruger Park. It's the only park left in the world that is natural. Far as, I mean, there's huge herds, huge herds of buffalo and elephant and the Cape, the Cape Buffalo. Um, just, I've never seen so many animals in my life. It's crazy. It's a site and it's 250 square miles. It's a huge park. Um, healthier ecosystem, well-managed multi-species operation, everything is thriving. So you have, the, you have the domestic animals, you've got the wildlife, the soil, the plants, the water, and you have fish. That's all in your operation. So if you've got a pond, don't think of it as just a livestock pond. Maybe that's your goal that you built it, but you should also be thinking about fish. Um, stock the darn thing. Maybe you can sell those fish. Fishing days, people come out and fish. You need to charge them. Folks, you gotta charge people. You can't let people come onto your farm for free and not charge them. They don't appreciate it. And Alan Nation was big on that. He always said, you know, people appreciate it when you have to they have to pay a little bit out of their pocket, they're gonna pay attention more. A uh, really good example of that is go to a, and I'm not, I'm not picking on NRCS, but if you go to one of the, the state-sponsored grazing schools where you just pay for, you don't have to pay any, maybe 15 bucks, and they, they provide you a meal. You go out there and look in that audience when you're giving a talk. 20% of the people are asleep. They didn't cost them anything, they just came for the meal. And so they're not paying attention. Nobody's taking notes. But when you have to pay a little something, you want to get your, you want to get your money value out of that. And I think that's a good thing. So uh, that's why we sell. You know, we've got people that are mad at us because we do custom hunting. We, have, we lease out hunting rights. You don't have a right to do that. You don't own those animals. Those are the state's animals. And I'm like, no, they're on my farm. We manage that farm so we have better ones than you do. I'm going to sell our right to purchase that animal or to pursue that animal. The same way with fish. So uh, some of y'all may have saw the, the video that I posted the other day of the cows in the pond. Any of y'all see that one? That was just heartbreaking. Big, big pond. These cows just destroyed it. Just destroyed it. And it's going to cost the lady 25000 to fix that pond. So not only does it make good sense to keep the cattle out, it also costs you a lot of money to fix it. And now there's poop and pee, and those cows were just covered in flies. The calves looked bad. They all had rough hair coats on them. Just not a healthy environment. 
I like to see a cow put her head down in the water and drink. And if they're licking at the water, folks, you got an issue. If they're licking at that water, not good. So moving the rams, uh, smaller animals are much easier to handle. So if you've got young kids and you're just starting out and you want to get into ruminants and you've got a small acreage, sheep. Sheep are a lot more suited than cattle for small acreages. Because if you've got, let's say, let's just say you've got five acres. How many cows can you run on five acres? Well, it depends. In Missouri, you could run maybe one cow-calf pair, but you could run 10 to 12 sheep on that same five acres and do pretty well. So you can run more of them. They're a whole lot more friendly for young people. They're not gonna hurt you. You can pick them up. You can't pick up a you know, 400 pound calf, but you can pick up a 40, 60 pound lamb. They require less forage during drought. So when we get into droughts in Missouri, the sheep always just shine. They're such a low maintenance animal. Um, and goats would be in that category. The problem with goats is just when they get short on forage and if you're not moving them correctly, they will look for another place to eat. And usually it's on your neighbors. <laughs> and the old the adage, good, good fences make good neighbors. Well, we had good fences and they still went visiting. And I didn't have good neighbors. All of a sudden I wasn't a good neighbor. I had neighbors that were mad at me. So. I miss the ghosts, but that's the reason we got rid of them. I just couldn't keep them home. Uh, they were characters a little bit like the, sh the, the pigs. They got a, a ghost just got a different personality. Um, you may want to, you know, lighten up on your cow numbers when you get into droughts. Uh, sheep and goats and chickens are much easier to manage through droughts than cattle. Chickens, you know, you're, you're bringing in feed and same way with the pigs. So even if there's nothing growing, you can still keep that going but you do have to buy the feed. Uh, I think this is the biggest mistake people make right there. When they get in a drought, they hunker down and they don't manage their pastures. Oh, it'll rain next week. I'm not selling anything because if I do, I'm not going to get anything for it. Uh, the next week gets there, you haven't had a rain. Yeah, it'll rain next week. No, you got to manage for what you know. You know how much feed you have in front of you. You know how many animals you got. You know the grass isn't regrowing behind you. You've been measuring it. You better sell off some animals. And that first cut needs to be 20%. You need to sell off 20% of your animals. When the grass is not growing back, go back in 30 days and look where you were at. And if that grass hasn't grown back any, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. Because you're going to be back around there, let's say in another 30, 40 days, and it still hasn't regrown, oh man. Now you're, you're looking at a golf course. And the worst thing about droughts is when you overgraze during a drought, it takes a full year to get back to normal sometimes, maybe longer. It depends how, how much you chewed it off. In Albuquerque, I was out there, and those guys out there, when they get in, they're always in a drought, but there's parts that have around New Mexico there, they only get to graze that farm once every three years. Now that's a rest period. <laughs> once every three years. It takes that long to grow something. And if they come back sooner than that, that's overgrazing. They'll have a desert. So while we're talking about that, if you're going to set up a grazing operation and you, you haven't planted roots anywhere, go someplace where it rains. Don't go to Colorado or Utah or New Mexico or Arizona. There's no rain out there. How are you going to grow grass if you don't get rain? You got to irrigate? Uh-uh. You can't irrigate and make money. And Ian goes as far as saying, if you build a, an operation around irrigation, in other words, your whole livelihood is built on irrigating, irrigating, irrigating. Sooner or later, the townspeople are going to come and say, you can't do that anymore. That's our water. You can't be using drinking water to, to grow cattle feed. You can't do it. So be careful. Where do you set up at? Go someplace that it rains. So that was the worst drought in Missouri history. That was 2012. Folks, this was about, uh, well, it was after Jan and I came back from New Zealand. So that would have been about July, middle of July, end of July. I mean, 
This is when people were selling cattle in Missouri. But I already sold off around 25% in June. The last of June, I knew we were in a drought. Terrible, terrible droughty conditions. And so we sold off, we kept the best animals, and we just glided right through that drought. Hurricane Isaac came in that fall, came up through Louisiana, and gave us nine inches of rain in nine days. Nine inches. And because we hadn't overgrazed our farm, we grew a ton of grass. But the neighbors, it all ran off. It all ran off in the creek. They didn't have anything to hold the rain. Okay, so try and keep the rain on your land. The only way you can do that is you gotta have it covered with carbon. You gotta have it covered with carbon. Something organic. There's what bare ground would do to you. So that was on the same day, right across the fence. This is my neighbor's continuous grazer. Uh, he uses the Columbus method. You know, he, he turns his cattle out in the spring and he discovers them in the fall. And so there, there's, just, there's just nothing there. And uh, I put that thermometer, it's 105 degrees. And over here in our grass, under, on the soil, I just set it down on the soil. I didn't stick it down in the soil. I set it on top of the ground, it's 90. That's right across the fence. He's 15 degrees hotter than my side of the fence. All I did differently is I've got carbon. I've got a nice litter bank. Folks, this is what a litter bank looks like right there. You like to see that. You like to have that dead material laying on top of your soil. It's like a big mulch. So when it does get a deluge of rain, like we got yesterday, Jan said it rained so hard, it didn't go very long. She said, but we got a half an inch in like eight minutes. I mean, it just pounded them. And I said, did you get any runoff? She goes, no, none. There was no water moving off that land. It just grabbed it. So if it grabs it and holds it in place, you're going to grow grass. If it runs off to the creek, you didn't grow nothing. You might as well not even got the half inch. So try and keep every drop of rain on your farm. Don't give it to your neighbor. Absolutely don't do that. So there's the pigs. These are the little guys. These are about 25, 30 pounds, fresh off of mama. That's the way we buy them is feeder pigs. We were doing sows and boars for a while. It's too much too much for Missouri. We weren't set up to do farming. So we run a train wire. That one's at four and that one was at eight. And it's got 8,000 volts in it. It's, it's inside our cattle and sheep corral. So when they get shocked, they go charging through it. Pow! They hit that and they can bounce it off and they get shocked again. And sometimes they'll reach up and actually grab it and chew on it. They'll put their mouth and chew on it. That's a bad, bad day for a pig. But we've got four paddock or four pins in this corral and we just rotate them. And we do that for about seven days. And boy, I mean, they're trained. We turn them out on, they go right out into the woods and woods in the edge of the pasture and we'll run that same wire until they get up to about 40 to 50 pounds. Then we drop it down to one. Uh, we don't have a guard dog in with them. Um, we've never lost a feeder pig to a coyote yet but we've got wire out there and it's hot. I mean, there's eight to 10,000 volts in that wire. That's our sheep and guardian dog gates. All that is is I have graduated from poly tape to poly rope. I use poly rope now. Poly rope is, oh my gosh, it's conductive. It's got, see, this has got um, six steel filaments in it that are conductive. Poly rope has 22. It's hot and it's, it'll last you forever. It's a rope. It's not, you know, it's about the diameter of that pencil right there. It's about that diameter and it is stout. I mean, it's a nylon, but it's got 22 steel filaments in it. And you can buy a roll of it at PowerFlex. That's who I recommend. Uh, I think it's 26, there's two different types. You can buy it in like 1300 foot roll or you can buy the big roll, it's like 2600 feet. It's not cheap but that gate will last you 20, 25 years. It's not gonna be something you're gonna be replacing all the time. When cattle or sheep or a guard dog hits that, they're gonna feel it, okay? There's the pigs and the rams. So we always take our rams out. We needed a place to put the pigs. These are some that we're fattening and uh, they just ran with the rams and uh, they got along great. 
They each like acorns. And so the rams, you can just see a line of rams and a line of pigs going underneath the trees. And they're just gleaning up the acorns. There they are when we were running them with the cattle. So the hogs would stay around where there was shade and they, they'd venture out and they would eat and then they'd come back in. Would the hogs move with the cattle? Yep. Like they would follow? Yep, the they did. They, matter of fact, the hog was the lead animal. Wow. In sheep moves, it's always the guard dogs, the first ones through the fence. On cattle and hog, uh-uh. It was always the hogs. Now, that changed when we put the horses in. We had three riding horses. I'm like, ah, oh, heck, I'm going to throw them horses in there too. We already had sheep, goats, chickens, cattle, and pigs. So I'm like, I'm going to throw a horse in there. So we threw our riding horses in there. This is when I got back from holistic management class, and a guy was talking about you shouldn't have any bare soil on your farm, and he came down our driveway, and there it is. I had these three stinking horses out there that weren't moved. It wasn't their fault. I call them stinking horses that shouldn't. I'm prejudiced against horses. I don't like them. <laughs> but I grew up on a horse farm. My dad had lots of them. Anyway, um, those horses had turned that field to bare dirt. It's just because we weren't moving them. It's our fault. So I took them and threw them in with the cows. The horse is the boss animal. You know why? Bigger. Bigger. What else? They got teeth. They can bite. They can bite. And they'd bite them cows. Bulls didn't mess with a horse. The horse would run up and bite them on the neck. They might even turn around and give them a good kick in the ass, too. I mean, they could kick. So a horse is a predator, man. I mean, they can really go after the other. So we had the pigs and the cows together. And I'm like, I'm going to turn them horses in there. We turned them three horses in there. And then those horses saw those pigs. And, I mean, they blew their nose at them. They took off chasing them. And it was about 95 degrees that day. And they ran them tamworth pigs around that field. I mean, just lickety split. Running them and eehing and farting and bucking and biting at them. And I'm like, they're going to kill them darn pigs. And these are tough pigs. They'd already been out there for a good while. If you did this to any other pig, they would have died. But them horses chased them pigs for about 30 minutes. And finally, the horses were having a great time. And they, they finally got them pig, and pigs finally said, you know what? You can just kill us. We don't care. <laughs> and they all laid down in a pile facing out. And they had a big circle of pigs. And they're all facing their predators. And the horses would take off running at them to try and get them to move. And pigs would not move. But, no, we're done. We're not going to run anymore. And they'd run around in the circle, and they'd eat in them, and they'd fart and buck and kick, and they'd just lay there. They wouldn't move. I went back and got my truck and we went home. And the next day I went out there, same deal. Pig grazing, horse grazing. Nothing was looking at the other one. They worked it out. So don't try that with wimpy pigs, though. Horses will kill them. <clears throat> They'll just run them to death. But those tamworth were tough, tough pigs. <clears throat> yes? Hey, keep them from rooting up everything. So how do we keep the pigs from rooting in a pasture situation like this. The only times the pigs would root would be early spring when it was raining a lot, like March, April. And in that time period, you don't want to have the pigs out there with the cows because they will turn over sod. In the summertime, we were moving them a lot. They had all the clover they wanted. They were on big areas. We didn't see them rooting at all, and we didn't have to bring them. Now, I have a friend up in North Missouri, uh, Dennis McDonald. He's got the mangalesis. You've heard of the Mangalista pigs? They've got a, well, they're a specialty grazing type pig, and they got fur on them. They got fur. And it's not, it's more of a fur, not a hair. Funny looking pigs, but he just puts one ring. It's a, one of those big round rings in the nose, and, that, and that's it. They don't root, but he, he, he does ring them, and that's how he you gets spot. What's that? You could do the same. We could do, we did, but we never rang the pigs. Um, it was just another thing that I didn't want to really do. And if, I, if I'd have seen them tearing up the pastures, I would have got them up and ringed them. But the only thing we did is we castrated the little boars because we had three sows that were farrowing out on the pasture. And when they got close to farrowing, you didn't go looking for them. 
When they got ready to pig, you left them alone.